mastering our qualitative methodology. I am Dr. Joanna Broussard. I am a qualitative research mentor here at Statistics Solutions. We are a full service dissertation consulting and assistance company. You can see all of the links to the services and the webinars we offer for free and how to obtain your initial free 30 minute consultation. We'll talk more about this at the end as well. But for those who are curious, my PhD is in rhetoric and argumentation. I have master's degrees in medieval literature and anthropology with a focus on historical linguistics. So I have done multiple types of qualitative analysis. I've done, you'll, I will be talking about some of my work, but not all of it. I'll be talking in general about some of the clients I've helped so you can see and get a sense of everything that can be done, that has been done, and that we can do to help if you get stuck with this particular chapter of your dissertation. So I'm going to warn you, this is a fairly detailed chapter. So as such, this webinar will be fairly detailed, but also these are things we could go into. And as someone who has taught at the R1 level for over a decade, these are each of these sections are things I could easily teach a full lecture or more on. So we're going to hit the high points and I'm going to try to answer some of your questions and alleviate some fears or anxieties you may have about choosing qualitative research and writing this chapter in your dissertation. Because this is often the last chapter you write before you send it out to the IRB. So it's very important that it be done well and it be detailed. So let's give you an overview of the chapter itself. You will have an introduction. Like anything else, you will tell us what you're going to tell us. You'll whet our appetites. You'll give us a sense of what's to come so we get excited for it. Then you'll talk about the research design, which includes your rationale for how you're going to conduct your research. We'll talk about the role of the researcher. What is your role in all of this? Because it is something that we really do have to think about as qualitative methods often involves talking to and dealing with living human subjects in social concepts and social ways. What methodology are you going to choose? What are the issues of trustworthiness and ethics that we have to talk about? And then we're going to summarize. If you think back to, and it may have been a while ago that you've taken a composition class, but like any good academic document, you have three seconds or three sections. Introduction, tell us what you're going to tell us, give us a preview, get us excited. The body, tell us what you need to tell us in all of the glorious detail that you can muster so we get a full sense of your knowledge, your expertise, and your plan and then your summary or your conclusion. Tell us what you just told us and give us that final thought, that final takeaway that we, that we chew on as we move on to whatever comes next. So this is the overview and you can see a chapter of your dissertation is arranged in a similar format. So the introduction, we have two main goals in the introduction. This is where you're going to restate the purpose of the study. What are you going to do? What are you studying? Somewhat why, a little bit of why it's important. When we say verbatim, you've already talked about this in chapter one, you've talked about this in chapter two. You need to say it in the exact same way. A lot of chairs will want you to use the exact same wording. So be prepared to do that. I know it's, it feels, but you've already read it in chapter one. You've already read that in chapter two. Isn't it going to be boring? A little bit, but a lot of this is, can you follow the formula? And so they want to see that it is the same. And you're going to preview each of the sections. We've talked a little, little bit about the sections already. We're going to body sections in greater detail. 
But in this preview, you should do more than say, I will explain what research design is. I will talk about the role of the researcher. This, I will talk about data collection. Give a little bit more detailed preview so we know not just that you're going to talk about it, but what you're going to be talking about. And so this section, roughly your intro should be about a page, 12 point times New Roman double space. You don't want to spend too much time here, but you want to give us enough of an introduction that we get excited, that we see, okay, there's a real thought out plan. And then you will move into the research design section. You will restate your research questions. Normally with qualitative, you might have somewhere between one and three research questions. You may have more, but again, keep the number of RQs manageable for the time you have to work on this study. Restate them verbatim. Then you will identify identify and define the phenomenon, the case, the concept. Maybe you want to study the phenomenon of trash talking in high school football uh, amongst opposing teams when a touchdown is scored. Yes, this is American football, so I'm, I'm learning the lingo after several decades of this country. Maybe you want to talk about uh, the phenomenon of <clears throat> teach of support for teachers who are teaching English to non-native speakers in a particular county in the state of Texas. Maybe you want to talk about uh, support for uh, self-care for mental health professionals who experience a high degree of burnout and job turnover. You will identify the phenomenon and you will define it. Definitions help for two things. One, they help your reader know what you are talking about and they set the delimitations. They set the range of things that will be studied so that way if someone goes, this is interesting, but why didn't you talk about this? Well, it goes back to how I defined the object of my study. That, that's a very interesting thing to talk about, but what you're asking didn't fit into my range of the definition. So you will talk and be, and you need to be as specific as you can and as detailed as you can here. So that way everyone is on the same page. A lot of this is helping any reader who comes after you, your committee, the IRB, if you publish it, or if it gets, once it gets published as a dissertation, anyone who looks at it later, the more detail and specificity you provide, the easier it is for them to follow and to understand. You'll identify the tradition, qualitative or quantitative. You'll spend a paragraph or two describing what, quanti what qualitative research is, why you chose it, what quantitative research is and why it wasn't ideal for studying this phenomenon. I'm assuming that you're all interested in learning how to do a qualitative methods chapter. And so we're going to assume that you're not going to do quantitative. You will also talk about the research design, uh, a case study, phenomenology, general, ethnography. And in, in so doing, you'll be telling us and your reader what you were choosing, a qualitative case study, a qualitative phenomenological study, a qualitative grounded theory study, a qualitative ethnography. You will, you will show us that you understand what these things are, but you will also show that you understand what the other options could have been, and you will justify choosing the path you have chosen by explaining why this particular type is the most appropriate to answer the research questions you seek to have 
answered. And you'll talk, and it will be this this other method is good, but it doesn't do this as well as this one. And we'll be talking more about the specific methods and designs in a little bit. So keep that in mind. So why would you use a qualitative design? Well, it's good for use with textual data. And that can be documents, that can be interview transcripts, videos. Maybe you want to observe a particular practice, a particular behavior. Qualitative design is really good for pulling out meaning from these types of data. For those curious, um, this textual data can be, like I said, it can be interviews. Maybe you want to interview particular type of teacher in a particular area. Maybe you want to look at documents, like say, uh, for my master's thesis on in anthropology, I studied the performance of masculinity through boasting in the Icelandic sagas. So I was looking at these 13th century manuscripts, these texts. You can look at school records. You can look at a festival as it's happening. Uh, lots of people study festivals in anthropology, whether it be Carnival, Mardi Gras, uh, the Deutsche Weihnachtsmarks, whether it, whatever you're, you, you can study festival, you can study particular rituals. Maybe it's a, maybe you want to study coming of age. A professor I had studied tourism at ghost towns in the American West. A really good friend of mine named Ari Gratch studied what was called dark tourism. He studied tourism at sites that are seen as dark, as re representing dark historical events. Specifically, he studied Jewish tourists taking pilgrimages to Masada. And so looking at that, looking at how, pe how people interact with these types of sites that represent darkness, how people interact with museum exhibits, how people converse. Maybe you're looking at a, maybe you're looking at something to do with um, glitz beauty pageant parents or some other type of public performance. Any type of data that cannot easily be reduced to numbers where you're seeking experience, understanding of how people perceive a phenomenon, how they experience the world around them. This is when you really want qualitative design. Now, I've mentioned a few things that have suggested data collections. Let's talk briefly. We'll do much more detail later on. You're probably going to be doing some interviews, either one-on-one -on -one or focus group. One-on-one -on -one interviews are often called key informant or key interlocutor. Focus groups, you're trying to get a group of people together who've had similar experiences. Each have their benefits, interviews, Sometimes people don't like sharing personal or private things in front of others, so you get that. Focus group, <clears throat> well, because you have multiple people talking, they can play off each other. You often, as a focus group facilitator, don't need to prepare as many questions if you have a good gregarious group of people who talk, who interact. So that way, and let them talk. Documents. Maybe you're looking at um, test scores or IEPs or observations or congressional meeting reports or bills before Congress or memoranda from a company. Maybe you're looking at company training manuals. I've mentioned Icelandic sagas, historical documents like um, diaries of famous or non-famous people because this is all data, observations. Perhaps you will go to the site where whatever the phenomena is you want to study is happening. Maybe you will observe. If you've ever been a teacher, you've probably had a principal or a dean sit in on a class 
and observe you if you've ever, and some companies might have, you know, you might have an observation during your initial hiring period. Sometimes they're just observing, they're not getting involved, and that's something you can do. You can also do what's called participant observation, which is where you participate in the phenomenon so that you get a sense of what it feels like to do this. This is something we see a lot in folklore, in anthropology, and so in similar disciplines where you go to a place, you witness, instead of just watching people perform a ritual, participate in a festival, you actually participate and take notes on what it was like to participate as you prepared, as you engaged, and after the fact, you reflect so you can see what it feels like and you can compare your experience to those of the people who participate. Be advised that your goal is not always to generalize. For the most part with qualitative data, you are not trying to make a grand sweeping theory. There are exceptions and we will talk about that. Oh, all right. Can we do all three ways of data collection in a project? Yes, you can. You can do all three methods of data collection, but be advised, and this is something I want you to think about as you're considering qualitative work, this type of data collection is time consuming. Participant observation takes time. If you're at a festival, you, how, you have to be at the festival. If you're participating, if you're observing a business meeting or multiple business meetings, you have to be at those meetings. Interviews take time to conduct. Focus groups take time to conduct, to set up, to transcribe. Documents, these take time to read, to get a hold of, to read and to analyze. So you can do all of these things together and it will make a richer experience, but it will take more time. So consider the method of data collection you choose based upon how much time it will take you. And again, you're with the exception often of grounded theory, you're not trying to generalize. You're trying to just understand a particular phenomenon in a particular place at a particular point in time for a particular group of people. You will not be testing a hypothesis. You will simply be, and I say simply like it's easy, you will be answering research questions through labor-intensive, rigorous data collection. You will not necessarily be quantifying the results because again, the goal is not to generalize. The goal is not to hypothesize. The goal is to understand. So let's talk about the five most common research designs, which are case study, phenomenology, a generic or a general qualitative design, grounded theory, and ethnography. We will be talking about these in a little bit of detail for each. Can a questionnaire be qualitative? To an extent, but for the most part, not really. Because if you want a qualitative questionnaire, you're looking at a series of essay, of open-ended essay questions. And it becomes something that is difficult to put together and is often time consuming for your participants. And so honestly, if you're going to do a qualitative questionnaire, an interview would be less labor intensive and less time consuming for your participants, which will more than likely get you a better experience. So just keep this in mind. So let's talk about case study first. A case study is when you want to look at a very specific example over time 
or you want to study a couple of cases that, are, that have a uniting factor. So a specific example over time might be a particular small town's harvest festival, a particular small town's carnival, a particular experience of maybe the practices of maybe good luck practices amongst baseball players at a particular school over a partic over a period of years. So you want to look at one place over time so you can get that depth of understanding. Maybe you want, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little bit out of order, but let's start with, maybe you want an exemplary case. What is an, a, a prime pristine grade A example of, say, a, of a particular festival? I currently live in Louisiana and with Mardi Gras season having just ended, maybe an example would be uh, the small town of Mamou, which is seen as the exemplary case for studying Cajun Mardi Gras. Uh, it's St. Patrick's Day here. So St. Patrick's Day in Boston would be an exemplary case. Maybe you want to look at an atypical case, maybe something that you've noticed or there's been talk that a particular example doesn't fit the bill for what's being described. Maybe uh, maybe you've, looked, you've read the literature and they've described a particular structure to a type of event, but there's this one case that you've read about somewhere, you've heard about, Maybe you saw it on a documentary that doesn't fit the mold. An example is something I've been slowly working on. If we go back to medieval and early modern Europe, all witch hunting manuals were written by members of the church with one exception, and that is the that is a text that is written by King James the first of England, James the fourth of Scotland. It is called the Demonology of King James. It is the only witch finding manual that is written by a sitting monarch who was not a member of the clergy, a member of the monastic establishment. And it is also in a markedly different rhetorical style than every other witch-finding manual within a 300-year period before or after. And it's something scholars haven't really studied. So this is a case, this is something that is good for a case study because it is atypical. It's different. It doesn't fit the mold. And it's also been really hard and engaging to study, but that's, a, that's for another time. Maybe you want to make a counterpoint because the literature in the field say, or in multiple fields say that X, Y, and Z happen with this particular phenomenon, but here's a case where it doesn't. Similar to atypical, but, you, but, you're, but your goal is to counter the literature, which leads to the next option. Maybe you want to take it in a new direction. Maybe you want the literature to go somewhere where it hasn't gone before. Maybe we've learned something. Maybe there's been some new theoretical framework that's come that's come about since people have studied since the last time someone studied this particular phenomenon. Heck, what maybe some big social or worldwide event like say the COVID-19 pandemic has changed how things are performed. How has that impacted this phenomenon? And so you're bringing in a new direction of in the wake of a major global pandemic. But let's talk more about briefly about what happens when you have one or more cases bound by a uniting factor? 
Maybe you're looking at multiple schools in the same school district for a particular, say, how is, and I'm thinking about some of my clients, how do teachers who are native English speakers engage first generation non-native student, English speaking students to help them succeed? What programs are in place? What strategies are used? What supports are there? Maybe you're looking at different schools in the same school district. Maybe you're looking at schools, similar schools in neighboring school districts, but in the same county or parish or borough. So with a case study, either it's one specific example over time or multiple cases that are bound by a clearly defined uniting factor. So the question was asked earlier about multiple data collection methods. This is where you're going to be doing it. You'll be probably interviewing people. You might be examining documents, newspapers, government records, um, school documents, grades, test scores. You might be looking at, you might be observing parent-teacher conferences. You might be observing classes. You might be participating in an event. And so what are you trying to do? You are trying to generate a rich description of the case or cases that you are studying so that we understand the phenomenon in that place at that time for those who are in the midst of it. You are trying to help people who aren't there figure out what's going on. I've, I've had a lot of clients who are in education and they want to maybe hopefully generate some policy change to better serve students. But we can't make change, policy changes if we don't have data. And so that's what this type of study is good for. You will be examining the emergent themes from the study of the cases so you get a sense of what's going on. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Let's move on to a little bit more difficult and more involved mentally. It's similar to a case study, but phenomenology is really where you are trying to get at the lived experiences of the participants. You are describing the meanings and sort of the structural framework that the individuals assign to a particular experience. I've got a client right now using phenomenology to look at the practice of, as I mentioned earlier, of self-care among community mental health professionals. So what is self-care? How do those who participate understand it? What meaning do they assign to it? How do they structure that meaning? This is where you will be doing in-depth interviews and prop maybe focus groups, but you will probably not be doing observations. You will, although if you're an anthropologist, I know some anthropologists who do field work, but that gets into ethnography. But you really want to get at that essence, the meaning that these individuals have. Now, it might seem easier because if you're just doing interviews, that's it's not going to take that long, right? Well, the challenge for this is you have to bracket off any assumptions you have about the phenomena related to your education, your own experiences, and try to and really focus on putting that aside so that you can get a sense of the meaning and the essence as these individuals in, who, who, who participated in your study understand it. And then you want to, but you, and you want to really see the commonalities. Where, what's, what is the common thread that comes through? You want to distill everything, this messy, muddy, experience of, that humans share, what is the essence of it? What is the essential, meaningful structure and nature of this thing? And that's 
that is a lot more mentally taxing and mentally engaging than other forms of thematic and qualitative analysis. It's a challenge, but I, it's one I think is super fun. Now, a lot of people want to do something generic. Maybe you don't really know what you want to do. Maybe your research question doesn't fit neatly into one of the other boxes we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. Maybe you wanna bring in elements of different ones so you can maybe get a fuller perspective than any one could do. Maybe your mixed methods. Maybe you do want to do some quantitative stuff. Maybe have a survey, a questionnaire, this is where a generic qualitative design will work. Often because you have such a broad focus of how you're collecting data, maybe in what you're trying to accomplish, you're going to look at what's called the out, outer world of a research question. You're looking at outward facing data, the experience, as opposed to the inward facing where which is what phenomenology is really good at. Instead of trying to get the meaning making, instead of trying to get the nitty gritty of how individuals understand and how they structure and make sense, with a generic study, you're just trying to understand what's going on at this point in time, in place for these people. It's, it's more surface level, but it's still deep. So that's one thing you've got to, you've got to balance that. And like I said, you'll be using mixed methods. So interviews, maybe some observation. This is where questionnaires work really well. This is where you might have some surveys that are either written or oral. Again, keep in mind, the more types of data you seek to collect, the more time it takes to collect and analyze the data. So that is something to be aware of. And as I said, you're trying to yield sort of a general surface, not super deep, but still, but not banal understanding of an experience. Most of the clients we have are doing a general qualitative design or they're doing a generic, what they call a generic case study, which is where they're trying to bring in, they want to do a case study, but they want to have a little bit of a, they want to have a questionnaire so that way they can get a little bit of mixed methods. So that way it feels like they're doing something that they're, maybe their committee will see as more quantifiable. Maybe they're trying to look at, if you're in education, the people who make decisions about education tend to focus solely on numbers. So that's where it helps. Okay, is this a basic qualitative design? All of these are basic qualitative designs that we've done so far. We're about to get into the more and some of the more advanced stuff, which will be the next two slides. So all of this is still basic. All of this is still generic and fairly straightforward. So we've been looking at fairly simple, but still involved things. Now let's look at some of the more detailed ones. Grounded theory. Maybe you want to do qualitative research, but you also want to generate a theory. This is what you're going to want to do. I'm going to, this is something I always warn people. It's not for the beginner. This is something that is extremely labor intensive, both physically and mentally. This is something that will take a lot of work. You're trying, you will need to have a fairly large sample size. And with qualitative research, that means it's going to take a long time to collect and a really long time to analyze the data. But so you want a vast number of perspectives. And when I and when if you're used to quantitative numbers, when I say you're here, you're looking at in the 30s or 40s, that's not many. But keep in mind, if you're interviewing 30 people and your interviews are an hour each, that's 30 hours to get the data. And roughly, it takes three hours 
per hour of data to transcribe the interview. So that's 30 hours for that plus nine, 90 hours for transcription. Then you have to go through and you have to code and sort and all of that clean up. This is really good though, if we don't know a lot about a topic, like if you've seen that some people haven't studied a particular phenomenon very much, hey, maybe you could do this. But again, it's a lot of work. We've talked about interviews and we'll talk about them some more. We haven't talked about field work. Field work is when you go out into the field to participate, to observe, to collect interviews. We're not talking about, for the most part, for an hour or two. Field work can be months to years, depending on the topic. If you're in anthropology, generally speaking, they suggest a minimum of three months in the field, preferably closer to a year. You want to really spend time getting to know the, the population you're studying, getting to know the phenomenon, getting to know what's going on. You'll probably be doing a lot of text and document analysis. You will be memoing, which is where you're jotting down notes during interviews, during observations, while, while analyzing documents. So that way you get a sense of your emotions, your thoughts, what's going on as it happens, so you can have a record. The more detailed your memos are, the easier it is to make sense of them later when you're going back. First at the end of the day, and then once you've collected data. And your goal will be to get theoretical saturation. The point at which you are convinced that you can't, you will not find any new information if you continue to collect data. And that is a point that it, it's not easy to know until you have a lot of experience, whether or not this is enough. But it is, you are deriving a theory that is grounded in the data. You're producing a broad explanation of an action, an interaction, a process. It's very helpful for understanding, you know, you know and the, the experience in a broad context, but it is a lot of work. And so it is not something that we, that I suggest, it's not something that any of my professors suggested for grad students. It's something that if you've, if you've been studying some of a particular phenomenon or similar phenomenon for a long period of time, then this is when it's really a good idea to think about you don't want to go, this is something that is easy to get discouraged on. And I want to warn you of that because qualitative data collection, because it takes time, it can lead to people getting discouraged. Long periods in the field can lead to people being homesick and it can lead to burnout. And that leads to the final advanced method, which is ethnography. This is really good if you want to understand a problem or a practice in its cultural or societal context. This is the hallmark of anthropology and folklore. It can be festival. It can be food practice. I, I know people who've studied the practice of, you know, bringing food to, to a family who, during a period of bereavement, after a funeral, of breaking bread. The process, uh, a professor of mine, the late Miles Richardson, wrote a book on, well, he, he, it was titled Being in Christ and Keeping Death in Its Place. It was how do Latin American Catholics under, use ritual to understand how death fits into their worldview. And, and it and was very much talking about the presence of death and how many Latin American, at least at that time, cathedrals had very graphically bleeding depictions of Christ on the cross that were central in the, in the church uh, and, and how the blood and how the death of Christ and how death 
fit into their understanding of life and Christianity. You can study ritual. You could study election behavior. You could study people study um, gentrification. People study, a friend of mine studied uh, voodoo in Haiti. So there's all of the, you can, you can study any practice that you can get access to. I know people who've studied uh, the practice of dressing up as fictional characters or cosplaying at San Diego Comic-Con. So, or a friend of mine did her ethnography on multi-generational families playing online video games together, specifically how multi-generational relationships were built, strengthened and maintained through playing World of Warcraft. So you can you can do ethnographic studies on really any topic. But again, interviews, you'll probably find a few key and what are called key informants who will help you understand what's going on, who you'll interview. Extended field work and observation with, with a focus on participant observation. To the extent that you are able, comfortable, and allowed, the goal of ethnography is for you to participate in this so that way you can get a sense of what it feels like to do this. And so you, your experiences here become part of the research. This is why you'll mem journaling, memoing, taking detailed field notes. This is essential for this type of research design. And it's, it's time consuming and it's labor intensive. And so what it does is it produces an in-depth account, which is also called an ethnography of the research problem from the perspectives of the participants in its cultural context. So using the idea of, of cosplay at a Comic-Con, instead of what do people who aren't part of that fan community think about it? What do the people who are part of the community, how does it signal membership? How does it show, how do you use it to show off maybe your skills to perform or to contest gender norms and gendered expectations? You really want to try to get this really deep, thick, rich account. We'll be talking about thick description a little bit later, but if you've ever looked at the work of anthropologist Clifford Geertz, his work on thick description is essential for ethnography. Rich, thick, detailed descriptions of the, of the sensory experience, of the emotional experience, of the mental experience. So that way people understand what's going on. And now we do wanna talk briefly about the role of the researcher. Are you going to be, what is your role? Are you just simply a facilitator for discussion in a focus group? Are you the interviewer? Are you an observer who will be passive? Are you a participant? Are you both observer and participant? Are you multiple things and depending on the, the where you are, you will need to really think about your role and be able to describe how you fit into the research because we're about to move into discussing research instrumentation. You are the primary instrument in qualitative research as the researcher. What are the, what are the potential conflicts of interest, power dynamics? Are you a member of the community? Is this a very closed community and are you an outsider? To what degree are you an outsider to this community? Are you a boss and are you planning to interview people who work underneath you? Because that type of power dynamic could easily prevent you from getting the data you need instead of getting the data that participants think you want to hear. Consider other forms of power dynamic, uh, biological sex, cultural gender norms, 
sexuality, how that plays into with your participants, um, education level. If you are in grad school, you more than likely are more educated than the majority of people in a in a particular society. And so how do how do you can you communicate that and your goal and what you need for your questions to these people in a way that they can understand? So you have to think about all of these things and be able to describe what they are and how you will mitigate them. What steps are you going to take to mitigate this? Well, if I am a supervisor at this company, none of the people I interview will report directly to me. How will you, if, if this, this is a marginalized community and you are a member of the dominant community, how will you gain access? How will you deal with perhaps that they're not going to be trusting initially? Because that can be a big factor. And we'll talk more about ethical issues later, but I've, I've already mentioned <clears throat> some brief ones. You'll be thinking about the ethics. You know, do you work at the study site? Are you a teacher at this particular school? Are you someone who is known to the people you're interviewing? Do you have some sort of role as a in the government? All of these things could be ethically compromising if you are not careful and dependent upon the situation. So these are things you really do have to think about at this stage. So but let's talk about your participant, shall we? First, let's talk about population. The population is the group of people from whom your sample will be drawn. Teachers in a particular school district in this county in Texas. That is the group of people. That is the population. Your sample will be a small subset of that population. How will you collect them? We use non-random sampling in qualitative research. Particularly, we're very fond of purposive sampling. You will seek out people who have some experience with a particular phenomenon. I've mentioned ESL teachers, English second language or English to non-native speakers. Well, if I want to study some perceptions of English to not English teachers of non-native speakers, well, then I need to sample people who teach English to non-native speakers. And so I have to purposely sample them. If I want to study self-care amongst mental health professionals, I need to purposefully study mental health professionals. You'll just, then you need to decide what your inclusion and exclusion criteria are. Using uh, English, English teachers, teachers who, people who teach English to non-native speakers, they have to teach English to non-native speakers. Maybe they have to teach in a particular district. Maybe they have to teach in a particular grade range. Maybe they have to have X number of years experience teaching. Maybe they are English. And maybe English is their native language. Maybe it's not. I see somebody has raised their hand. Uh, so, uh, if you've raised your hand, please let me know because I can't see anything other than that. But you will be defining this criteria for your study. How will you verify it? How will you know the criteria you're looking for and that you're being reported is accurate? These are questions you have to think about now. Will you look at records? Will you look at um, if you're, again with teachers, maybe you're going to be maybe you'll look at their transcripts. Keep in mind if you've ever had transcripts sent, you know how long that can take and how much of a pain in the butt it can be to get those transcripts. But how will you verify? Will you be trusting participants? Will you be looking at some sort of official document? How many participants? How many cases? If you're doing a case study, are you going to have? Again, with qualitative research, we often suggest eight to 12 participants. 
is purpose of sampling only qualitative design? I am not an expert on quantitative, so I am probably not the best to answer that, but because quantitative often seeks to generalize to as broad a population as they can, uh, quantitative researchers are more than likely to use random sampling so that way they can get a more accurate depiction of the population as a whole. So while it may not be exclusive to qualitative, 99% likely it is only going to be qualitative scholars who are using it because you are studying something specific. Although I could see with medical trials, maybe you're looking for people who do have a particular medical condition. And so to an extent you'll be using purposive, but with quantitative, you really do want to try to get a broad random spectrum that covers sort of the whole of the population. Or you might use stratified random, which is something totally different. And for the workshop as a qualitative research design, how much participant we can entertain in one workshop? Um, that will depend on how long the workshop is. If, if a workshop is where some where you're trying to teach people how to do it, um, you really want to have a small number, six to eight. As I was saying, with the number of participants for a study, eight to 12 is sort of the normal range for interviews because of the time it takes to conduct interview and to transcribe interview and to analyze and code the interview. But you will also need to define in this section the steps that you will use to identify potential participants, to contact them, and to recruit them. This can be using email communication, phone calls, word of mouth. Maybe you're part of a listserv or a Facebook group that you could use. Recruitment, uh, will you just ask them to do it? for some studies. Okay, uh, Sarah, that is a much more detailed question than I can answer in this time period for this webinar, but we can probably talk at a later date. You know, if you want to participate, to explore and to participate and to learn about it, you're looking at at least three to six months minimum for that. I mean, we don't have a lot of time to go into a lot of these details because I am, what is exclusive to exclusion criteria? That will depend on your study. And I hate to say it that way because it sounds like I'm being dismissive, but it really does. What, whatever you're trying to study, you've got to set parameters. So there, what, so something that might be inclusive for another study will, will be, could be exclusive for another. If I want to study novice teachers maybe i need maybe they have maybe inclusive will be one to three years which means i am then excluding four years or more if i want to get a detail of experience of, of teachers phenomena of teachers experiences maybe i want experienced teachers there's so there's nothing that is exclusively inclusive or exclusively exclusive it will all depend upon your study and that is what makes, that is one of those things that makes qualitative research frustrating to many people, because for many things, there are no set answers. It will depend on the study you're doing and the definitions you've established going forward. But recruitment, maybe you're going to offer like say a gift card to Amazon or $5 cash or some sort of small compensation for the time that your participants are going to give up. That's not unheard of. That's not uncommon. It's not required, but it is something that many people do. And so you, ought, you have to describe that here and have a plan for that. What's the size of your sample? Well, if you want eight to 12 participants, why wouldn't you just collect 12 interviews? 
Well, what happens if somebody pulls out? What happens if somebody doesn't show up? What happens if somebody decides later on that they don't want their data used? So these are things, this is why if you want between eight and 12, a rule of thumb is to sample between 15 and 17. You want at least three more to be sampled as part of your sample than the number of participants you want to you want to get. So that way you have just in case. And always remember, it's better to have more data than not enough data. Because the goal of finding a good sample size is you want data saturation. You want to reach that point where when as you're coding, nothing new emerges from a new from a new transcript, from a new piece of data. And so you've really got to think about, about how many people is that going to get? Individual interviews, eight to 12. Focus groups, usually you want two to three. Okay, if, Alicia, if you're using incentives, you, are, you, will, you probably don't need to explain a strong rationale because people understand that it, it, it makes people more likely. You will definitely want to explain what you're going to be doing, how you're going to be doing it, and a couple of sentences why you feel that this is the best way to do it, okay? You really want to then basically say, here's the incentive I'm going to be using. If you've ever known, if you've ever gotten something from the United States Census Bureau, they send you a $5 bill. That's an incentive to participate. Uh, the Nielsen television rankings will send like a $10 bill if you agree to become a Nielsen family. It's a lot more common in quantitative studies, but it does happen in qualitative studies with some regularity, especially if you're concerned that your population may be hesitant to participate. But if you're going to use an incentive You've got a plan for it. You've got a budget for it. And so, and you've got to declare it, which is what you're doing in this section. So these are things to think about with your participants. Now, your instrumentation. We've already said the number one instrument is you, your body, your, your, the way you've moved through and experience the interview, the focus group, the document, because different types of things feel different when you're doing it. But you also have to think about an observation sheet, your interview protocol, which are the questions you're going to be asking. Will you be creating your own? Will you be using something that's already published? More than likely, you will be creating your own, especially for an interview protocol. And so document review. How are you going to determine if these documents are valid and accurate and verifiable? So these are things you've got to think about. You will demonstrate how these sources of data and these sources of data collection are sufficient to address your research questions. With an interview protocol, this is often what we call RQ mapping. You will map your questions to your particular to the particular research question that that question will provide some sort of data toward understanding and answering. An observation sheet. Okay, so what are you planning to observe? How will observing that yield the data that you need? Document analysis. How will the doc this document give you the data that you need? When I, I mentioned my thesis on do boasting in the Icelandic sagas, I said, well, given that um, Viking era Icelanders are no longer living, the only way to understand this is to use these written record these written accounts that, that are generated from older oral tales. We don't have any, we don't have any firsthand evidence because everyone there is already has been dead for almost a thousand years. So this is why this is what we're using. But I then went and I verified the accuracy of the document, of the edition I was using. 
I didn't have funds to go to Copenhagen to look at the actual manuscripts that are in the archives in at the University of Copenhagen. So I had to use editions using the Roman alphabet. But you need to demonstrate how this is going to answer the questions you have so that way your committee and the IRB feels that what you're doing serves a purpose and is going to be beneficial to your participants and not wasting their time. Now, we've talked a little bit about this, but let's go into a little bit more detail for some of these procedures. You do need to, for each instrument, where will you be collecting the data? Interviews via Zoom have become super common since the pandemic. Maybe you're going to do face-to-face -face interviews. Maybe you're going to be doing participant observation at a festival. Where? When? We need all of these details. Who will be collecting this data? That's you, more than likely. How frequently will these events be? Well, are you going to this festival once a year when it happens for five years? Or are you going to go to this festival when it happens only once? What will be the duration of the events? How long will each interview, each focus group be? If you're observing, what are you observing and how long will that observation be? If you are a participant at a festival, well, how long are you gonna stay there? Usually the answer is for the duration of that festival. How will you record the data? You can record via Zoom. You can record on your cell phone. Maybe you have a voice recorder but you need to talk about how you're going to record the data. And I've already discussed contingency plans in case of attrition. If someone backs out, what are you going to do in case that happens? How are you going to compensate? How are you going to debrief yourself and any participants if necessary? Self-debriefing, that's often journaling at the end of the day. Maybe after an interview, you write down some notes how you feel about the interview. Maybe you reflect on, uh, did I thought, maybe I don't think I followed up with enough questions. I don't think I really engaged them. You reflect and you, and you, and you prepare and you think about, so that way the next data collection event can be more meaningful. And this is something that happens throughout your data collecting career. You can always improve, you can always learn more. Maybe you need to debrief your participants after something. Maybe you observed a class and you want to talk to the people involved. Maybe after you've observed a number of teachers or a number of professionals in whatever setting, maybe you gather them together just to sort of debrief them on what happened, some general things that you're talking, and, and tell them what's going to happen afterwards. But let's talk about follow-ups. Are you going to be using member checking? Are you going to be allowing the people you interviewed to verify and to check over the transcripts? It's a very good idea if you do. Let, let them see if you've recorded what they said accurately, if you've understood them, if you've presented them in a way that is accurate and not problematic in some ways. It, and that's... Most research isn't going to do that, but if you have a background in anthropology, you know, maybe you decide you want to study drug dealers or underground economies that are extra legal. Well, are you presenting things in a way that's not going to cause them legal issue? And that gets more into the ethical considerations later. But if you have to do a follow up because you have some questions while you're going over the data, do you have a plan in place for that? But you should let your participants read over and approve and verify the transcript. Is this what you said? Did I record what you say in an accurate way that, that you recognize is how you said things? Does this, maybe you wanna have, maybe you'll have them look over your findings and your thematic analysis to see if, hey, this gels with my experience because these are all ways that we talk about confirming and establishing trustworthiness for our data, which we'll talk more on later. <clears throat> but I wanna mention it now because 
once we've gotten our data collected, we've got to analyze it. So we have to have a data analysis plan for each data type. How is it connected to your research? So how will this data address your research question? What is the process for analyzing the data? If you're, I'm going to use transcripts as an example, okay? First, you've got to transcribe the interviews. Then you member check them, <clears throat> and then you move into coding. Coding is the process of pulling out units of meaning that can be grouped into larger themes or essences, depending on the coding procedure you're using. The most common is the six-step method by Brown and Clark. I'm not going to go into it into too much detail, but you'll be writing out that six-step method if you use it. Step by step, I will familiarize myself with the data. I will, which means I'll be reading over the transcripts multiple times and taking some notes. I will code <coughs> by pulling out units of meaning from the transcripts. I will revise those codes. I will group them together and form themes. I will revise the themes. I will then check the themes against my research questions. Then I will write up my report. Are you going to be using software? If you're doing any type of mixed methods or if you've done quantitative, you know that you might be using SurveyMonkey or some other uh, Google Forms I've seen being people using now to collect survey data. Um, are you going to use in vivo for coding purposes, Max QDA, or some other form of qualitative software that's available to you at present or when you start working? How will you handle discrepant cases? How will you handle cases that really just don't fit? You need to have a plan in place for this. And then we'll talk, we need to talk about trustworthiness. I'm going to be brief, we're almost done. But you need to do a lot. You need to do all of these things right here. You need to demonstrate your credibility. How much confidence do we have in the accuracy of your findings, which you can establish through triangulation? That's why people often use multiple sources of data, interviews, document analysis, observation. So that way you have multiple places where the data has hopefully said similar or, or identical things. When dealing with humans, you're almost never going to get identical. You are probably going to get similar. Yep, uh, Tagity is good. It's not, it's not one that we use a lot here, but it is good. So again, don't have time to go through all of them. We are currently working on developing our own, but that is a ways away. So I can't tell you when that's going to be available. But you need to be your credibility, the credibility of your findings, the credibility of the work you have done. You need to be able, you need to be able to, how are you going to show that? Transferability. How applicable will your findings be to other contexts? That's why we need to talk about thick, rich description so that we can see maybe the con, maybe there's similarities, maybe there's a few similarities, maybe there's a whole bunch of similarities. So how much description can you provide so we can see how applicable your findings might be to someone else? Uh, using, going back to my own thesis work on boasting in the Icelandic sagas, I looked at literature on boasting in the sagas. I looked at verbal dueling, playing the dozens among African-American uh, male teenagers in Philadelphia. I looked at trash talk in sports. I looked at um, boasting in Homeric and, and Virgilic epics. I looked at all sorts of other verbal contexts, verbal contests. Some were much more similar than others were. I looked at trash talk, um, people who studied trash talking in video games because you want and found some things are applicable, some things are not. Some results transfer over to different contexts. But remember, the more different the context, the less likely it is to transfer. So be careful when you're thinking about that. How dependable, how consistent are your findings? 
in that we could replicate? Is there sufficient information? Is there a sufficient description? Is there a clear, detailed audit trail of everything you have done? So that way, people who want to do the same thing or something similar can follow and maybe get similar results. Confirmability. Are your findings based clearly based on the participants and their experiences and not just your own ideas? This is why we do member checking. This is why we allow them to verify. Okay, the question asked is, am I able to guide students through the process of the project implementation to completion? Yes, yes, we are. That is a service we offer. And it is something that we will talk more about at the end because we can do that. We are multiple extremely talented consultants and experts who can help you with that. Melissa, you're going to handle, you're going to type the response to that so I can then keep going because your trustworthiness is where you need to have, where your readers have confidence that you did, that you did the study to the best of your ability, a good faith effort. Remember, we can't know everything. We can't observe everything. But did you do your best? And do we have confidence in the work you have done? And let's talk about ethics. So you need to have discussion of your agreement, the IRB agreement. What is the process for getting your IRB approval? Site permissions if you're going somewhere to perform analysis or observation or to interview, you have to get permission from every site you visit. Treatment of human participants. Uh, again, this is where we talk about you know, your permission, your informed consent, the ethical considerations of recruitment. Will participation in the study have any negatives? Could it expose them to legal issues? Could it expose them to physical, economic hardship, to psychological hardship? What are some of the things to think about in data considerate, in data collection? Identifiable information, or how are you going to pr protect confidentiality? Are you going to collect identifiable data? Or will participants be completely anonymous where, e where other than where you don't really know who they are? How will you protect your participants from undue exposure, from any negative consequences? What are the risks that you can, you can foresee? All studies have risks. Sometimes they're minimal, but you need to think about what these risks might be. What are the benefits going to be? How are you going to secure the data? And after a certain period of time, what are you going to do with it? Traditionally, this would be all data will be kept in a locked filing cabinet uh, where the researcher is the only person who has the key. And after five years, all tape, all recordings will be destroyed and all transcripts will be shredded and burned. Now, with most things being digital, it will basically be, well, will you, how, where will you keep it on a secure drive? Will you keep it under password protection? Who will know the password? Who will have access to the drive? How will you destroy the data after, the, after a period of time? Usually it's after, after five years. Let's face it, if it's on a hard drive, especially an external hard drive, it can be really satisfying to smash that hard drive with a sledgehammer. So keep in, so how will you destroy, how will you protect the data so that no one gets it and uses it for anything negative? And then you will finish with your summary. You will recap the main points. You will go section by section. You will pull the reader along from the problem to the purpose, to the research questions, to the method, to your methodology, to your data analysis and to your ethics. And then you will transition to your next chapter, which will be the results after you've collected and analyzed the data. And so now I know this chapter can be daunting. That's okay. Start with the problem. 
the purpose and the research questions. Then ask yourself, what data do I need to answer this? Who do I need to talk to to find these answers? What documents can give me these answers? What observations will give me these answers? Then, you know, write it as a recipe. Okay, if I want to do this, I need these ingredients. And so these are the instructions I'm going to use to obtain these ingredients and turn them from a bunch of ingredients into a finished product. So your methods and your methodology can change all the time. This chapter right now is the expectation and it will probably not be the reality. And so, but don't worry about that. If it happens, when you get to your results chapter, you can talk about what changed and you can talk about why that had to change. Maybe you planned face-to-face -face interviews, but a hurricane, a tsunami, a blizzard, a pandemic hit, and that became not possible. So you had to move to virtual space interviews through Zoom or Teams or Skype. So the methods is your plan. It is the recipe on the assumption that everything will go perfect when you're doing it. But you, but you, your committee, and everyone else involved understands that perfection is probably not going to happen, and you'll have to make changes on the fly. Now, it has been asked, and I do want to mention, if you do need additional support, Statistics Solution is a full-service dissertation consulting company that provides graduate students with timely editorial support from their dissertations and other scholarly projects. We can guide you from prepping your prospectus to working on your PowerPoint as you prepare for your, your final dissertation defense. We can guide you step by step all the way, helping you with anything else, anything you might need in the process. If you want more information on our services, you can receive a complimentary 30-minute consultation available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern U.S. time by contacting Ms. Janine Glaze at info at statisticsolutions.com and our phone number, which you can see is 877-437-8622. We have experts in qualitative and quantitative. We have research specialists. We have people who can help you with every aspect of your dissertation. We can guide you. If necessary, we will start with the most basic premises and move you step-by-step step along in a timely, professional manner. We help with addressing feedback. We help preparing for questions. We can help you throughout the entire process. I know we went a little bit over and I apologize for that, but thank you for bearing with me, everyone. If we have, a, I, will, I will throw the floor open for one or two final questions. Magdalena, you are most welcome. One or two final questions. You are welcome, Jesse. I do hope this has been helpful. Carolyn, thank you. You're welcome. You're all welcome. And if you do want more, we do provide other webinars on every aspect of the dissertation. We also have a blog where you can get information and you can also get a consultation, 30 minutes for free with Janine. And then if you need, and we can provide you with any level of assistance you need from start to finish. All right. I'm glad you guys seem to enjoy it. Thank you very much for coming. Again, I'm Dr. Joanna Broussard of Statistic Solutions. I am a qualitative mentor, and I look forward to helping those of you who need some help. Should you choose to sign on with our company, we are timely, we have expertise, and we also tell really, really, really bad jokes. So if there are no questions, I'm also warning you about my jokes. My, my sense of humor is dad jokes. So the pun is, is the one for me. That being said, it is Friday. It is 5.20 Eastern Standard Time. I will leave you with this. Your dissertation 
is not the end, it is the beginning. It is a long and arduous process, but it's something all of you are capable of not just completing, but of succeeding. We will be sharing this recording through email so that way everyone has access to it. I know that comes, we will send the email like roughly in a couple of days. So once again, going once, going twice. I will stop the share right now. And everyone have a lovely, lovely weekend. And I wish you the most success you could possibly have in your academic, professional, and personal lives. Have a great one. Goodbye.